This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit provides information on how you can lead a healthy lifestyle. I'm the host, Josie Bidwell. Search for and subscribe to Southern Remedy on any podcasting app to not miss any episode. morning and thanks for being with us today on Relatively Speaking. I am Dr. Susan Buttress and I'm here with Abram Nanny. Good morning, Abram. Good morning, Doc. How are you doing today? I am doing well. I'm doing very well. Had a good 4th of July and I hope everyone had a very safe 4th of July after we talked about food safety and and fire firecracker safety and I know all of that. I certainly did. Good. I was I was very well behaved all weekend. Well, I'm very proud of that and happy and and I hope everyone else was was well and happy over the fourth. A good time to celebrate. But today we are talking about one of my favorite topics, I have to say. It's my behavior one oh one topic. And the the basic issue is that if you have someone, a child, a significant other, an employee, an employer, a friend or even your pets, if they have behavior problems that you are having difficulty with and difficulty understanding and not knowing how to manage it, there really are some very simple rules to behavior management that are, I call them gold nuggets in making life easier and better for you and for the person or pet whose behavior that you would like to change. So today we're going to go over those basics of behavior management and then how you can really use them in your everyday life. So I, you you look so excited. I am. I'm excited about <laughs> it because so I love excited. doing this, and and I I know because I I frequently get asked questions from from my friends, from my family, not just my patients, but from others about the basics of behavior and what to do about this particular behavior. So um, one of my favorite topics, like I said, I hope we've got open lines. We can start at any point if you have a question about a a behavior of a coworker, or the behavior of a grandchild or, or a child of yours or, or just a friend, feel free to go ahead and jump in and, and give us a call at any time as I go over the basics because I really am going to be sort of laying out groundwork as we move along. Or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. So as we get started, I think, first of all, let's sort of lay the groundwork about sort of understanding general behavioral issues and, and, and sort of the unfavorable behavioral issues that come up and, and sort of understanding why they happen. And most behaviorists say that they're basically four functions of behavior. Um, and, and understanding what those are, understanding that behaviors occur for a reason. They just do. And so as we're breaking that down, we'll, we'll go over what those reasons might be. So, you know, if there is always a reason for behavior, then it gives you a better understanding of of why those behaviors may be happening. And so then um, negative behavior like aggression or self-injury or um, elopement or whatever you can understand what that hoped resultant of that behavior might be. 
Okay. And sometimes behavior can serve more than one single function at a time. A child or an adult might act out in order to get attention or because they're frustrated or because they cannot do what you've asked them to do or because they're tired or hungry. So understanding the function and the reason behind the behavior can can be really, really important. So I'm going to first just list the the primary four functions of or reasons for behavior. Um, I've mentioned a couple of them already. Social attention. So the, the first is often just for attention or attention seeking. So the point is, look at me. I need you. I want you to look at me for a reason. So that's number one. Number two is escape, and I just mentioned that. If you can't do a task that you're being asked to do or you don't want to do a task that you're being asked to do, then you're going to figure out a way to escape from that behavior. And sometimes escaping from from being asked uh, to do a particular task is to divert it by by some behavior, temper tantrum, for example, throwing something, yelling at you, saying something unkind. All of those are negative behaviors that can cause an individual to escape from uh, behavior. Okay, so that's number two. You know, a good example of, of that in a, in a home setting is that a child just might run away if they don't want to take a bath. I mean, my puppy did that the other day. Puppy didn't want to take a bath, so he he ran Mine does away. The same thing. <laughs> we uh, we trick them with peanut butter. That's the best way that we can get them into the bath. But perfect. It's very tough to do that. Regardless, I can't imagine you do that with a child, though. <laughs> you can give some positive reinforcement. It doesn't have to be food. Okay. the The other couple of things that I'll mention, seeking access to something that they want. So a particular behavior, that the number three function of behavior, is, is wanting something. So the behavior is opposite of escape. So they may go toward something they want that you perhaps have said they can't have. So um, to, to going after it. Um, for example, picking up the phone or the iPad when you've told them that they can't use it. Okay. And then the other reason for behavior is sensory stimulation. Um, something that feels good so that you, you demonstrate that behavior, whether it's negative or positive, because it feels good. Now, in the autism world, it may be self-injurious behavior, headbanging. Whether we know that feels good or not, it gives some sort of sensory stimulation. So I'm kind of all over the spectrum talking about children with autism and pets and adults and the like. But you can see that if you think through it, those four general functions of behavior can pertain to almost any aspect, whether it's an adult, a child, or a pet. Social attention, escape, social attention, escape, seeking access to a tangible, and then the sensory stimulation or the feeling good. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We can digest that. I want us to go to our first caller. We have April in Gulfport. Hi, April. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm glad you called. You're, you're, um, you say that you are divorced with kids. And so talk to us a little bit about some of the difficulties that you're having. I know that can be tough. And if you've listened to this show before, as I've talked about my own personal life, been there, done that. And I'm sorry you're having to go through it uh, because I know it can be difficult. Yes. Um, it was a 17-year relationship. And so um, and I, as I've gone through the dating um, world for the first time in, in really that long, um, I'm finding it to be very challenging 
work, and I'm currently in a relationship, a very fresh one, for just a few months. But I'm very serious about it. And um, and he, the the guy seems to really benefit by having uh, downtime. Um, I'm with, I have my kids once a week, every other week, and so when I when I have my week to myself, I find myself immediately wanting to go be with him. And that we've, that's proven to not be um, to not be beneficial, mm. um, despite the fact that I want. That's what I believe that I want. Um, and so, I, I've I've been very I felt very hurt um, when he's needed to have time away to recharge. Um, he needs a great deal of it. And when he's when he is recharged, he's absolutely wonderful. And I find so many valuable qualities about him. Um, when he's in an irritated mood, it, it harms me very much. And so I'm trying to see if there's any behavioral tips you might have that can help me to um, lessen the effect that his irritable state might have on me to see if there's things I can control better. Because I feel like I do have a history of codependence. It's probably not best for me to want to spend all available time with him. So I see value in space. Um, so I'm trying to I'm trying to do better there. Yeah. Wow, April, you you are asking a question that I'm glad you called, first of all, and and you're reaching out about this. And you've touched on a couple of things that that I think you're absolutely right about. Um, first of all, um, you you mentioned a couple of things about your relationship, your new relationship that I'm a little bit concerned about. But but let me step back and ask you a couple of questions. So how long have you been divorced? <laughs> Not long. Um, December, what, it was final, and okay. um, it was a two-year process to get there. Okay. So you, you spent some time in a, a not-good relationship and then some time working to get get out of the relationship. Did you feel like there were any similarities in your previous, uh, in your marriage, as there are in this present relationship? Yes, the pushing away. I do. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm feeling as if I've identified that maybe I am attracted to, to individuals who are, who are pushing me away. They don't seem to want all of my love. Okay. So... And, and that may be possible because one thing that individuals do um, when they get into another relationship after a, a previously failed relationship is often make the same mistakes again um, in choosing a partner who is perhaps not a fit but somewhat like or much like the previous partner, if that makes sense. So um, the other thing, too, though, is I'm wondering, and, and April, I, I hope you take this as constructive questioning, I'm wondering if you know how to just be alone and, and be able to do some self-entertaining and, and do something just for you without having someone next to you. I've studied that as well. It seems like I can't seem to last more than two days. Mm -hmm. It seems like if I've left a relationship, it's within two days that I'm already speaking to somebody else. So no, that's a major weakness. Major weakness. So it does seem like you need to first work on that before you really get into any kind of long-term relationship because I will tell you that can be draining for other individuals if they feel that all of your happiness is, is reliant on them. And if you are totally dependent on them, to give them what to give give you what they what you need okay so you you may have if you li you have listened to this show before as we've talked through relationships one of the sort of the hallmarks in finding a good partner 
is being able to give that partner everything that they need and understand all of their needs and that you put them above your own and vice versa. Your, your partner should do the same thing for you. So, so that, that you understand what an individual needs and they are not constantly trying to satisfy your need or needs. And so, um, You mentioned codependency, and if you really look at the definition of codependency, you you really are relying too much on another individual for your own satisfaction. And so, you know, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert and you you need positive reinforcement all the time from the outside or if you're one of those individuals who tends to be able to to give you the positive pets that you need all alone, let's put all that away and just look at being comfortable in who you are. And I think that's going to be really important. And I you mentioned perhaps needing some counseling, and I think it might be a good idea for you to have someone to help support you, because it sounds like some things that you need to do um, is, is, one, be able to understand that you can stand independently alone without anybody else. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't need friends. That doesn't mean that you don't need outside interest. Every one of us are better individuals if we have other people in our lives. But what I think you're trying to do is hone in on having one person be that only individual for you. Do you have other friends, girlfriends, or family members that you can can be with, that you can do fun things with? Do you have other hobbies or interests that you can get involved in, like um, walking, like sewing, like gardening, like swimming, biking, any of those things, reading, any of those things that can be really good for your mind and body, but doing just for you, not necessarily with somebody else. So does do you have that? Have you tried to work on that yeah. a bit? Um, yes, um, I, I have a lot of that. Um, I would I, I would be entirely busy um, doing plenty of things. Um, I wonder if the answer is to halt all communication with the romantic interest, um, you know, for, for some time, all communication. And that way I, I come back to him with a fresh, with a fresh perspective. Hmm. I, I wonder if that is the answer, because if I continue communication, it, I'm still falling into the code, codependent pattern, I feel. Not necessarily, okay? So maybe change the way you communicate and maybe step back a little bit on it. Perhaps it would be good for you to think about, uh, are you feeling that you need to be in touch every day, several times a day? If, If that has been the case, maybe step back. And on that week that that you don't have your children, maybe at the beginning of the week, say, without kids this week, I've got this, this, and this planned. But if you have some time at the end of the week, maybe we can get together. So instead of just cutting it off completely, to to try to change the way you're, you're dealing with this relationship so that he is not expected to fill in all the space. Now, there may be some people out there who are listening who are saying, well, is this guy even worth it if he doesn't want to be with her all the time? Um, and I'd love to hear from any any callers if you have if you have a differing opinion about that. But what I'm saying is that a healthy relationship has two 
individuals who can stand alone and be alone on their own and support each other. So I, I think most healthy relationships do want that. They don't want an individual who needs them all the time because it can feel smothering. Abram, I'm I'm seeing a little bit of a nod from you. What do you think on this one? Yeah, I always uh, and I I can't speak to the experience of being in a a relationship for 17 years. My wife and I have been married for a little over two, and we were dating for about a year and a half before that. Right. Um, but I do think that it's of benefit to both people if you're already the best person you feel like you can be individually. And then you get into a relationship. That's that's how I've always looked at it, is that like you can present your best self to the person that you want to be with. Yeah. And the other thing, too, April, is to, to think about it. Instead of jumping into another monogamous single relationship, maybe, I know, dating when you're older is not easy. I was there. I remember it. Um, but I will say it, it might be good to, to just think about going out with individuals as friends, going on a few different dates, not feeling like that you need a one and only right now. I think you need to be able to work all the way through those feelings that, that you need your time and space to feel with with another individual who who becomes that sort of permanent partner again. You want to step carefully back into something like that. Divorce is tough. It's hard with kids, even harder with kids, I think. But I know it can be lonely without kids. And so I'd love to hear from others if they have comments on this as we move along in the show. But from a behavior back to the behavior management standpoint, if if someone is giving you signals like this individual is to you, that he needs some time and space, then... Step back, give it to that individual, and find another way to occupy your time. And then really think through, is this an individual that is somebody that I need in my life? If he's irritable and irritated when I'm around, think through that one, too. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, April. Thank you so much for your call. All right. (laughs) All right. Behavior management, behavior 101, Um, the consequences of behavior, the effects of behavior uh, from another individual onto one, uh, how you can shape behavior and how you can manage men are all things we're going to talk about. I also want to talk about positive and negative reinforcement as we're moving along. But before we get into that, I want to talk about just the basic tenets of behavior. And they're the ABCs of behavior. If you Google it, it's out there in many different forms or fashion. And, And as I was just looking at what is out there now, because this is something that I've been interested in for many years, I'll say a lot of the ABCs of behavior are referenced when there is talk about treatment of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is the ABCs of behavior pertain to everyone, and so listen, listen to this, and it will make sense to you as we move along. Okay, the A stands for antecedent or the context or events that happen immediately before the challenging behavior. Okay, so what's going on before the behavior that you want or you don't want to happen happens? Okay, the the B is the challenging behavior 
that is is happening, right? Whatever the behavior is. It may be a challenging behavior that you don't want, or it may be a behavior that you do want. But it's that behavior right there that we're talking about. And then, then the C stands for consequence, or the events or context that happen immediately after that behavior happens. So that's the ABC. Okay. So, so let me give you a very, very simple example of uh, ABC. So the A, the antecedent is you walked in the room and said to your five-year-old, it's time to turn the TV off and go to bed. And the behavior is a screaming temper tantrum. No, I don't want to turn off the television. No, 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 I don't want to go to bed. And then the consequence is you what? What do you do? So the consequence might be that you walk over, turn the TV off, and tell the child they're going to bed again. Or the consequence may be, oh, have you not finished your show yet? Okay, I'll give you five more minutes. And then we'll turn the TV off and you walk out. Okay. Now that second one might not sound too terrible, but what did you just do with that second second possible consequence? Abram, what do you think just happened? It's it's a little bit of encouragement. Of, like you you validated the behavior that you didn't want in the first place. Right. Right. So you validated that temper tantrum. You said, "Up, oh, that temper tantrum just bought you 5 more minutes." Even though it only bought you 5 more minutes, it taught that 5-year-old that if I if I threaten to turn the TV off, if I have a tantrum, then mom will allow me or dad or whoever it is will allow me to watch it a few more minutes. Yeah. And then and then the tantrum becomes more prevalent in other places as well. They figure if it yeah. worked on the, the bedtime, then it'll work in the grocery store. And right. So, so that's so expansion forth. of that behavior rather than constriction of a behavior that you don't want. Now, that's very, very simple. But if I may go back to our first caller, the the. The friend guy that our first caller was talking about became irritable when he wanted more time alone. And what happened? She went away because he was irritable. And so he has learned that instead of turning to her and saying, honey, I really need some time alone. Can you give me a day? I have to just go blah. Then instead of doing that, she reinforced his irritability with her by turning and going away. So instead, she could have said, and I didn't recommend this, so I hope she's still listening. She could have said, you seem very irritable. What's going on? And then hopefully a person who had good open communication could say, well, I really need some time alone. I wanted to read this book. I really didn't want us to go out and do anything. And um, I, I just need a few hours of alone time. So that's a good, honest, open, communicating relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something else going on. But what could happen when you don't have good, open, honest communication and you have kind of a mini temper ta adult temper tantrum about something is it might ind engender suspicion that something else is going on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also like talking about um, the communication and stuff. Like you also want to make sure that you, not only are you getting the point across, but you're doing it like effectively and kindly. Like you don't want to approach someone and say, am I bothering you? 
because that's going to be like, well, you're not bothering me. Like, and, and if they do answer it like, yeah, you're bothering me, then, th- then you're going to get your feelings hurt. And then that's going to cause a bigger problem. Like saying it like you said, like, do you need some space from me or are you feeling ir- irritable right now or something like that? could be much more effective than saying, am I getting on your nerves? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you don't seem happy. You, you seem a little irritable or sad. Is there something I can do to help? That way you're turning it into a positive rather than you're acting mad at me. What's wrong with you? And I think we all, we, we all have made poor choices in the way we, we state things. I know I have. And sometimes uh, I have to turn around and go, sorry, I didn't mean to say it that way. Let me try again. And that's okay. At least you've acknowledged that that might have graded on somebody. But, but to make sure that as we're walking through our ABCs of behavior, that we are thinking logically about what just happened and why it happened and how maybe you can change that. And so, you know, even talking about this in the context of, of the workplace, the same kind of thing can happen. If you are an individual, for example... I'm one of those open door people. When I'm in my office, I often leave the door open so that I am letting people know that that I am happy to talk to them about an issue. But if somebody walks in my office because my door is open and I'm working on something and they come in to talk to me about something and I'm being distracted from the work I need to do, what would be the best thing for me to do? Get out of here. <laughs> Go somewhere else. That's, that is uh, not my my. Not my go-to response, but uh, that's what I do once in a while. Every now and then. <laughs> so, so the response, a good, open, honest response is, oh, gosh, I'm working on something right now. Can we talk about that later? I should have closed my door. I need some quiet time. People often have a really hard time doing that kind of thing. But it is truly the best way to openly communicate and you can do that without being insulting without being without yelling get out of here you can say and then what you need to do is say i'll be through in about an hour i'll let you know when i can talk and then you get up from your desk you walk the person out and you close your door so sometimes you have to give people harder messages. Uh, sometimes people are very perceptive. And if they say, oh, gosh, did I interrupt you? You can say, yes, you did. I need about 30 minutes. But, but to, to make sure that good communication is out there. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Abram Nanny. We're talking about, we've been talking about the ABCs of behavior management, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence, and how that can apply to relationships, how it can apply to behavior management of children, of pets, and, and in the workplace, and how important it is to try to keep it keep that ABC model in mind, it's not really just an academic exercise. It gets you in place so that you can better understand why people do what they do and how perhaps you can change it. Okay. And I also promise that we'll get to my general rules of behavior. But before we do that, we're going to go to Gunner in North Mississippi, who has some behavior to discuss of a domestic partner. Hi, Gunner. Talk to us. Hey, how are you? Good. Glad you called. My domestic partner seems to uh, use what I think of, you may need to define it better for me, uh, passive-aggressive, meaning that the least little thing that 
may be inconvenient because of my action gets a thank you like oh you threw that down so i could pick it up thank you or you failed to pick that up or you didn't do the you left this undone and all and so with all the you know and and here again there's always two sides but with all the positive things i do like try to keep everything neat try to keep everything done try to do what's asked of me and then try to be proactive mm-hmm. then the least little thing is 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 an is a negative like well you know I, i've done 99 percent of what that list said but i forgot one thing oh thank you so now i've got to go back to the store and pick up this one thing after i brought you know uh, several sacks home mm-hmm. and then left one thing out what where, where does that come from? How much? Uh, and, and and the thing is, is that when you try really, really hard, and then you're ch- criticized and chastised for that one little thing, that that kind of smarts a good bit. Sometimes it it hurts a lot. And then, you know, in that same pattern, there's a lot of just plain old criticism about uh, you got hair growing out of your ears, or uh, mm. won't you trim your mustache, or uh, uh, your teeth mm. are yellow. Once you go to Venice, you know things like that. Is that just like the decades we've lived together? That's all coming to to a head. Yeah. Uh, have Have you lived together for many years? And was that behavior there at the beginning of the relationship? Well, you know, it. it I think it was. I think back on it now. I think there was enough just love and and desire to make it work that maybe it got overlooked it's 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 not just me that notices it it's our children that notice it it's the fact that um you know we can get a lot of criticism but we can't really give anything back without it turning into sometimes a blow up or a or a diatribe of what Mm -hmm. you know why 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 it's not that way Mm -hmm. you know and have you, Gunner, have you had open communication with her about this? Because what I'm hearing is is behavior that can be very damaging to a relationship and damaging to to your feelings of love. It sounds like you you really love this individual and you want things to be okay. Well, that's that's exactly true. That that is true. And and, and what I wonder is what you mentioned a while back about reinforcing behavior um you know i think because we we did wind up with fairly large family and just because of tradition and because of uh well i mean it, love is definitely in there but also to to, to keep the trauma from the kids mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think we all we, we all like just tucked her tucked her tails and, and took it mm-hmm. um for a long time, I think each one of us did, and I think we all learned sort of how to play it, to play it down, to even omit things that we knew were going to cause reaction, just to be sometimes found out later to get a bigger, more violent reaction from, mm-hmm. you know. So, I mean, have we reinforced this to the point where we can't back out of it? Or, or you know, I've been counseling myself counselors will always ask well can we talk to her would Mm -hmm. you care if we talk to her and get her side of all this i'd say sure please and then when it comes time for them to for me to say well they'd like to talk to you so you could tell them just how bad i am she says i'm not the one broke and that's the end of it right there so i mean counselors will say to me well we've gone as far as we can unless we kind of know the other side of the story and so it never goes any further Have you sat down with her and looked her in the eye and said, this this cannot go on the way it is. I'm really not happy with the way you talk to me and the way that you talk to others. Um, Or perhaps to say... Not, I don't think I would say not happy with the way you talk. Let's see. Let me change my words. I'm, I'm doing this on the fly. But, but Gunner, the first thing I would do is, is sit down with her. Has, have, has it been pointed out that I am trying very hard 
with you and and I feel like I'm never quite good enough for you. Have you yeah, said have. those it words does. to her? Yeah, yeah it more or less the same words. Uh, and it doesn't go any, any further than that. It's like and you never it's it's mostly her saying, Will you never change? Will you never do the last little step? Will you never uh, you know, and, and, and that's the, in the conversations, you know, I picked up enough that never and always are really two words that never need to be in an argument because nobody absolutely nevers and nobody absolutely always. Is. And, you know, say I can go behind her and pick up things that, that got slipped her mind or, or got left off and never mention them. Just, I mean, it's what you do for another person. Yeah. Oh, so... So what do you do when she says, well, you got all these things from the grocery store and you forgot, blah. What do you do? I do usually say, well, uh, I, I I just I miss it or, or I cross it off too quick thinking I'd pick it up when I came to it. Or I used to come up with an excuse and then just say, I'm sorry. And, duck my, and I say, tuck my tail and that's about it. Yeah. And of course, now, you know, there are there are times and there still are times where I might say I might actually react, respond, defend myself, and then it says oh, you're always great at making up excuses. Excuse, that's just an excuse. You come up with an excuse every time, and then, and there again, always and never, mm-hmm. always come up or seem to come up in, in most of those times. And things go back twenty years. You said you were going to paint this door 20 year, years ago, yeah. and, and you still haven't done it. Well, you know, there's. Are you are you said 20 years ago you'd keep your desk clean and look at it now? Yeah. And, you know, or you said 20 years ago you're going to make the. Um, and and well, I mean, it just you name anything that was a big blow up, it's remembered and it's brought up, you know, later again. So have you tried planned ignoring? Like if she says something like that, um, when you pick the groceries up, to say you could just completely ignore if she says something like you miss this, you could say I did my best and walk out, and or you could not say a word and walk out to make sure that you don't engage in that. I do think it's important for you to make it very clear that that the hypercritical behavior is difficult to continue to to listen to and that you do wish that she would work on it. The other thing you could do, and if there is a time when she compliments you about something, is to to go to her and tell her how much that means to you to hear something loving and positive. Thank you so much to make sure you reinforce that. I do reinforce that when, when it happens. Yeah. And, 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 and I, again, occasionally they'll say, okay, this looks nice. And I will profuse it. Oh, thank you. You know, thank you. Well, I, it. I, over, I say, oh, I thank you very, yeah, thank you. I worked really hard on it to try to yeah. Sure what you wanted, and you know. and to also remind her that that it's okay to say nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Neither one of us are perfect, but we're both trying. And to just come up with a short sentence that you can say that that hopefully stops that. Um, if it's something that you feel like you really should have done, say, yep, I should have done that. I'll take care of it. If it's something that you think she's being hypercritical, it, I think it's okay to say, you're picking at me. I've told you I don't like that. I don't know that I would just always... Um, I, I, the, the important thing is to stay calm because... It may be that now her way of engagement is to get a reaction. So make sure you're giving her attention 
that is positive attention? I don't know. Is she feeling lonely in her skin? I don't know what's going on. It's hard to know, but it sounds like she may just in general be an unhappy person. And um, I'm sad for that. And I know from your children's standpoint, it sounds like they're probably adults now, that that they probably tend to stay away from her if she's being hypercritical like that. So she probably does need counseling. I think it would be a good recommendation to give her some counseling. It sounds like you've tried to work on this. But I would work on some planned ignoring and some one-liners that you stay with over and over again, Gunner. I hope that yeah. would help. Well, the, yeah, the plan ignoring, I, 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 I try that. And if, if the thing is, if I react in kind at the very, at what I feel like is a very reasonable tone, then I'm the one going into hysterics, you know, and I'll, and, and, you know, I, I, again, I just try to never raise my voice. Right. Good. And, I'll, and I appreciate the help about the one liner and, and trying to be. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do try to keep things calm, and, and, and I just don't engage. And, you know, yeah. the thing is, you, you say you pick your battles. Pick your battles wisely. Well, I just never battle. Yeah. And, and yeah. I wonder, you know. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know, I know you're about out of time. And I am. Good luck, though. The rest of your time. Uh, all right. Well, I hope I'd love to hear back from you and see if anything has worked. Okay, so in the last minute, I'm going to go through some just some real basic rules because good parenting, good relationships are not for lazy people. It takes an effort. You have to be consistent, and you have to follow through on on rules. It will make everyone happier. So be consistent. No means no. The direction or a command is weakened every time you give in. So if you mean something, say it firmly, say no, but use it sparingly. So also label the behavior that you want. Don't say be good or be kind, but say, I would love it if you would do this. I would love it if you would say this. Make sure your directions are good, simple, and concise. That works for adults and children. And so try to avoid name-calling. Don't say you're bad, you're mean, but to talk about your words seem unkind. Okay, there are a lot more. I think we need to do a part two on this, and I will because I want to go over some of these other consistent management techniques that will make life easier. But right now, I want to remind you that if you want to listen to this episode in its entirety or any other podcast, just download your favorite podcast app and and listen to southern remedy relatively speaking this show is a production of mpb think radio engineered by my producer abram nanny and our call screener was marissa vaughn today marissa thank you marissa i'm dr susan buttress and i hope you'll join us next tuesday at 11 for relatively speaking and stay tuned for npr's here now coming up next right here on mpb think radio this is an mpb think radio podcast To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.